thanks also to Casey for, for really a lovely introduction. Um, so, uh, so these two materials that you see on the screen in front of you are, are really quite different from one another. Um, they share something, which is that each of these uh, materials does something spectacular and stimulated in a particular way. These systems on the left are, are ones that we understand quite well. Um, and uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is, is the scientific quest to start to understand uh, some of these systems on the right in, in a similar kind of way. So, uh, so what are these things on the left? Uh, so these are laser rods. Um, and uh, so, so this is actually uh, the first ever working laser. I mean, it's, at its core is one of these rods made out of ruby and surrounded by a, a light bulb here. Um, so why is this ruby spectacular? Well, uh, if you turning on uh, this light bulb, uh, you, if you turn up the intensity, and so you're driving energy into this, uh, this ruby here, first what will happen is uh, it will start to glow. And then all of a sudden, you pass a, a transition in intensity and, and, and an abrupt threshold, um, this will begin to laze. Um, and uh, that means is out a directed beam of monochromatic light, so a particular wavelength. It's also coherent. And so LAZE, as you know, is a, an acronym that stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission. So, so why does this? Well, uh, inside of of this laser core, so called gain medium. Uh, there are some atoms, and they can absorb energy and transition from a ground state into an excited state. Then they can decay, emitting a photon. My clicker is uh, unfortunately having some having some difficulties here, but uh, if necessary, we can we can we can move back to the the computer. So so they it will these atoms will decay, um, emitting a, a photon. And uh, uh, so as uh, the name suggests. The reason that the system is able to laze is something called a stimulated emission. So uh, what happens here is that one of these photons can go and knock another atom out of its excited state into its ground state, emitting two photons, two identical photons. And these two photons can go on and make four photons, and so on and so forth, leading to exponential amplification. All right, so that's why uh, we get this kind of gain or amplification. But why is there that threshold? Well, uh, it turns out that this is due uh, crucially to an interaction between the photons and the atoms. So uh, in particular, uh, when this photon comes through, it, it knocks this atom out of its excited state into its ground. And that means that for this chain reaction to take off, there have to first be a sufficient number of, of atoms in the excited state that have been uh, pumped up by, the, by energy. And this is a so-called uh, population inversion. So it turns out that uh, for lasers, this is actually only the beginning. Um, so this sort of first laser on transition um, uh, is actually in, in many systems, there's a number of other really rich uh, complex behaviors. So, so for example, uh, there is some lasers where uh, if you send in a, a relatively low intensity of light, uh, what happens is actually you get, you get an oscillating uh, amplitude uh, set of photons out the other side. And then uh, if, as you cross some magic line in intensity, uh, all of a sudden these oscillations become chaotic. And then as you go to even higher intensity, all of a sudden this chaos entirely disappears. And back, we click. Oh, okay. Uh, we go back to, uh, and we go back to, to really just a constant amplitude signal. So, so for, even a singular, there are many complex behaviors. And we can map these out uh, using something called a uh, bifurcation diagram. Um, so, uh, so this is, as, as mentioned, this is really a map of the behavior of, in this case, of one particular laser. Uh, so as a function of uh, the, the, of to it. So in this case, uh, the driving input light power um, and also uh, the, the, the wavelength of that light. Uh, so for example, uh, in this particular system, uh, if we sit at a particular wavelength or color of light um, in this diagram, so if, if, we're, if we sit at, at this particular wavelength, say, um, and turn up that lamp, first 
uh, will cross a transition where the laser goes on, in this case at a constant amplitude. And then a little while later, we cross this other red line, uh, and this laser starts to oscillate. This is, as mentioned, a, a small part of the diagram for, for this uh, one system. The full diagram looks like this. Um, so this is legitimately quite complicated. Um, but the beautiful thing about it is, is, that, is that we understand it really quite well. So uh, these curves here are calculated from, from a mathematical model, and the points were measured on the actual uh, laser. And, and what this means is really two things. First of all, uh, we can predict what types of behaviors uh, a given laser might show, and we can choose ones that have behaviors that we're potentially interested in. The other thing is that we can control this, these types of systems extremely well. So we know exactly how to dial in a particular power and, for example, a particular wavelength to get it to do what we want. And that has enabled uh, engineering of, of, of just a, a, a spectacular array of, of laser based systems, one of which, of course, I'm holding in my hand right now. And actually, you will see several different applications of lasers uh, throughout the rest of this talk. Right, so, so those are those uh, materials on the left. Uh, so what about this other material that I put up here? So as you may recognize, this is your skin. Uh, and uh, we're also interested in things like your tissues. I mean, and so, so what is the spectacular response that, that this that ha can happen in this system? Well, it can become inflamed. Um, and uh, this is a response that, that we don't understand nearly as well as, as we do uh, those lasers. What I'm going to tell you in the rest of the talk uh, is, is how we can sort of start to go about um, uh, under, trying to understand this system in, in a similar type of way. Um, so, uh, so the rest of the talk will be divided in, into three parts. Um, first, uh, what is inflammation? Um, second, I'd like to tell a short story about two different cells. This is really beautiful work uh, from a team of, of physicists and immunologists in, in this field. Um, uh, to illustrate some of how we might start thinking about inflammatory states. And finally, uh, it's about uh, how we can maybe tackle the slightly more complex problem of inflammation in, in real tissue systems. So what is inflammation? So as early as uh, 30 CE, inflammation was recognized as, as, um, as a phenomenon that was characterized by four uh, cardinal signs. So if you have redness, uh, swelling, pain, and heat in the same physical location, this is inflammation. <clears throat> so now we know that underneath the hood, what's going on is that uh, when there is damage to uh, your tissues or an infection, there are specialized cells that are called sentinel immune cells that live in your tissues that detect particular molecules that are associated with uh, both this tissue damage and also with uh, different types of foreign pathogens. And so, so one of these cells, which, uh, uh, which I'll mention several times, is called a macrophage. So these cells detect these signals and, and uh, detect, excuse me, detect particular molecules, and they start uh, uh, making a bunch of different signaling factors, some of which are these cytokines that are uh, written on the slide here and, and some other small molecules. Um, and instruct nearby blood vessels to both dilate um, and also to open up gaps uh, that allow immune cells and also fluid to escape into tissue. And uh, this causes the characteristic redness, uh, swelling, pain, and heat. Um, so some of the immune cells uh, out into tissue uh, are cells called neutrophils, which are really professional microbe killing cells um, and, and together, and there's also an additional influx of these macrophages um, and together uh, these, this, this whole burst of, of both cellular and uh, fluid response is able to, uh, is able to kill and, and contain infections. So to situate these responses within the broader context of your immune system, these inflammatory responses are uh, the essential uh, line of defense against uh, pathogens. And these are part of the so-called innate arm of your immune system. Um, and so if the innate immune response is not able to fully take care of a particular pathogen, then it recruits the so-called adaptive arm of your immune system. These are your B cells and your T cells. And uh, so what distinguishes these two arms uh, is, is, is broadly that 
neat immune cells uh, have a fixed set of receptors that recognize uh, particular common uh, patterns that are associated with, um, with microbes, common molecular patterns associated with microbes. And by contrast, uh, your adaptive immune cells have specialized receptors uh, that are actually able to change over your lifetime uh, to learn to recognize pathogens that your body has already seen. So this, hence the phrase adaptive. So, so this inflammatory or innate part of the response is absolutely essential to our survival, and it's also actually very dangerous. Um, and one of the ways that we know that uh, is that sometimes, unfortunately, somebody can be born with a genetic mutation that takes out a very small part of the system. So for example, uh, it's possible to be born with a mutation uh, that makes it so that your neutrophils are not properly able to adhere to be able to crawl out into your tissue. Um, and this is actually, if untreated, is actually usually lethal in infancy because you get a lot of soft tissue infections. Um, this is too little inflammation. Um, and, it, and it shows us that actually uh, in all of us, our innate immune systems are continually taking care of infections that, that we never perceive. On the other hand, it's actually also possible to be born uh, with a mutation that takes out one particular, actually one of several uh, repressors of a particular important pro-inflammatory cytokine or signaling protein. Um, and so if you're in this repressor, um, then you have a rampant hyperinflammation. Um, uh, often, of, of, in this case, it happens to be of skin and bone. Um, primarily, and, and this is actually also uh, lethal in infancy if, if not treated. So, uh, so this shows us that this system is, is both essential and really finely balanced and can, uh, in the wrong circumstances, wreak havoc. Um, but you might say, well, okay, but I'm sitting here before you because I am a human being with every single system intact, so maybe I don't need to worry about it. Um, but uh, it turns out that unfortunately for us, that's also not, not true because these responses can go awry um, and uh, lead to things like chronic inflammation, um, fibrosis, which is a uh, long-term scarring, uh, which can uh, cause quite serious disease, especially in things like the liver, the heart, uh, the lungs. Uh, and, and even more catastrophically, there are some responses uh, uh, like sepsis and other cytokine storm syndromes where it looks like the sort of hyperinflammatory response just runs away. So for a long time, uh, we've drawn sort of schematic diagrams that look something like this, uh, which implicitly imply that, uh, that there are distinct states underneath the hood, that there's something uh, that there's there's maybe we can describe um, inflammation in this way. Um, but uh, we have very little sort of concrete uh, quantitative uh, ways of doing this currently. Um, and so, uh, so what we'd really like to, to, to do and to really ask how to do is how we can go from picture of inflammation that looks like this to one that looks more like this. So next, uh, I'm going to tell you a, 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 a story about a, a myth that I think illustrates how we can start thinking about uh, inflamed, uh, inflamed states and also sort of what are the, what are the ingredients that we need uh, to start thinking about the inflammatory system in this way. So as mentioned, this, this is a really nice set of work uh, from a team of, of physicists and immunologists. The perspective that they start from is, is that uh, inflammation is really a departure in tissue homeostasis. So here, this is a, a, a fixed section of tissue that has been stained for, for a few different cells. And these in red and green are, are a couple of different types of immune cells. Uh, so this is what normal skin tissue looks like. And this is what uh, inflamed tissue looks like. So uh, you will notice uh, that the cell numbers have changed. As in our, in our laser system, um, the way that we keep track of this is to keep track of how many photons there are here um, and how many of these atoms are in their excited versus their ground states. And this characterizes, characterizes the state of this system. For our tissue, what we're going to want to do is keep track of the number of cells of each type. Uh, so now I'll introduce you to these two cellular characters in this minimal model. 
One of them is one that we've met before. So these are macrophages, which as mentioned, they detect pathogens it come uh, to, to wounds in large numbers. The second is a type of cell called a fibroblast. Um, these produce matrix proteins that are essential for repair. Produce too much protein over too long, uh, this leads to fibrosis. And it turns out that these two uh, different types of cells feed one another. So uh, fibroblasts produce a protein that make macrophages grow and vice versa. Because of this cross-feeding uh, and a few other bells and whistles, if you mix uh, these two types of cells together in a dish at a really wide range of starting uh, frequencies, start a, a wide range of starting ratios of, of these two cell types, they converge to one particular fixed ratio of these two cells. So this is uh, uh, a stable... Um, and it's an inflamed state because we have lots of macrophages and lots of fibroblasts. So more generally, uh, we can plot something called a phase portrait of which uh, we start with a particular uh, number of macrophages and fibroblasts in our dish. Uh, where will that system go? That is, uh, how many will we end up with? So as we just saw, uh, for a relatively broad range of starting of, of, of these two cell populations, uh, this converges to a state where both of the types of cells are feeding one another. And so there are lots of macrophages and lots of fibroblasts in this particular fixed ratio. This is a, a high stable state that uh, they call hot fibrosis. In total, uh, this system has three steady states. One of the uh, other one is uh, the uninflamed or healed state where you have no, mac no macrophages and no fibroblasts. There's another interesting one, which, which uh, these authors called cold fibrosis, which is uh, that you have a lot of fibroblasts, uh, but no macrophages. So this is uh, calculated from a model. Um, let's uh, recapitulate this, this behavior. What does this picture give us? So first of all, it gives a suggestion about why some wounds become fibrotic. So under ordinary circumstances, when you get a wound, there's some kind of transient inflammatory signal which drives in a population of macrophages. But uh, ordinarily, uh, this, this signal resolves. And so this population of macrophages is left without in any, uh, any fibroblasts to feed it. And so it'll just crack. Um, and so, and back down to, to the healing state. So this is this, this transient swell of these inflammatory cells, uh, which, is, which is associated with sort of normal inflammation and healing. On the other hand, uh, if there is an injury that occurs too soon, um, then it can drive the population of fibroblasts up, crosses this, this magic line here, then the system will inevitably head to this other uh, high fixed point, fibrosis point. So uh, this, this picture also gives us some ideas about how it might be possible to intervene uh, to uh, bring the system back where we want it to go. So in particular, uh, one of these suggestions is that if you're in uh, this hot fibrosis state and uh, you, you are able to put in a treatment that temporarily uh, increases the strength of this particular negative feedback loop here, um, then you can drive it back across this magic line. And then even if you remove the treatment, the system will on its own toddle on back to uh, the healed state. So this really nice uh, minimal model gives us a picture of both uh, what it means maybe to describe an inflamed uh, state and, uh, and what we might get out of that. Um, but we would really, what we'd really like to do is attack this sort of more complex problem of, of what actually occurs in our tissues. And in particular, um, inflammation is really a fundamentally spatial uh, uh, process. So this is a local excitation, and we'd like to understand how it remains local. How is this spatial extent that we see here set? And when and how could this break? So as mentioned, this is a, a sort of a spatial interacting phenomenon within the space of, of, the, of the tissue. So in particular, uh, what cells we have here uh, and their spatial arrangements matter because they, they, these interactions uh, occur mainly through diffusion of different signaling molecules 
amongst all these different cells. So previously we were keeping track of, of the number of cells of each type. Um, and now what we would really like to do is also see where they are in space and time, in, ideally in one of these real systems. Uh, in, in other words, we need to watch the movie. How do you watch the movie of in a live organism? So uh, there's, there's actually a lot of really beautiful work done on this uh, in mice, uh, but some of us uh, like to try to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, and uh, as uh, Casey uh, uh, very nicely mentioned in the introduction, it turns out that, that zebrafish actually have all of the immune cells that you and I do, um, but they have one huge advantage, which is that they are they're tiny and transparent. Um, so we can do a lot of microscopy, both the types of light microscopy quite easily. Uh, to give you a slightly more visceral sense of scale, uh, this is your adult grown up zebrafish that you might have raised in your fish tank. It's a couple of inches long. Uh, and uh, this is the actual scale of, of one of these little guys uh, when we image it. So uh, as I mentioned, we would like to be able to where these different immune cell populations uh, that we're interested in are within the organism. Um, and we do this through the, the ab absolute wonders of, of biology. It's now possible to have the native population of cells in an organism start making a fluorescent protein of your choice. Um, and so, so the way that this actually works is, uh, so uh, another wonderful thing, nowadays it's possible to uh, buy off the shelf your uh, gene of interest encoded in DNA. So you buy, you buy your DNA uh, and you inject it into a zebrafish embryo or egg uh, uh, at a very early developmental stage. Um, and uh, your gene will integrate into the genome. There's you know, some, more, some more stuff involved. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you can have uh, an, an animal, in this case a zebrafish, um, where a cell population that you are interested in um, makes a fluorescent protein of a particular color. Um, so for example, uh, in this case, we've labeled macrophages here, and here these are T cells. So now uh, we can look at them inside the organism. So for example, this is uh, uh, T cells live uh, in skin, um, we're looking at the side of, of the tail fin here. Um, and these guys live in, there's two layers of skin. They live on the top and the bottom of the fin. It's a volume scan here. One of the other really neat things is that there have been a lot of recent advances in fluorescence microscopy that now enable us to watch uh, behavior of some of these cells over long periods of, of, of time in relatively large uh, areas of tissue. So uh, for example, we can use a technique called light sheet microscopy. Um, and what we do here is we make an effective uh, sheet of light using a laser. Um, and uh, we, we take the sample and scan it through this sheet of light. Um, and at each step, we, we at each sure whole plane uh, of, of fluorescence um, information, giving us uh, this, this volume uh, each time step. And so, and this enables us to, to collect fast uh, volumes, and it also turns out to be quite gentle uh, method of imaging, so we can image live organisms for, for a long time. Um, and uh, so, so, for example, uh, we can observe what these T cells are doing uh, inside uh, the tail of that fish. We're looking here at a relatively large portion of uh, the tail of the zebrafish, and each of these little white guys is a T cell. Um, and uh, this movie is much sped up, so this is two and a half hours of real time. Um, and these, so these, and this is actually a completely uninflamed state. And these cells just normally uh, explore throughout the tissue. Um, looking at this, uh, zooming in and looking in a little more detail, um, you can watch again as these cells explore in interstitial spaces and tissue. But as, as mentioned, um, so these cells are out in tissue; they're in circulation. Well, there are also T cells in circulation. You'll very occasionally happen to catch one streaking by. Um, but uh, so these guys are, are adhered to extracellular matrix and they're crawling around amongst other cells. Um, and uh, what I'm applying on top are just uh, measured uh, trajectories to show uh, where some of these cells have been. So, uh, so these cells uh, just explore around looking essentially for foreign elements uh, in, in their native state. Uh, and oh yeah, we can, let's, that's a little bit longer. Um, 
But uh, there's other types of immune cells uh, where we can start to observe uh, some of these types of, of that I was mentioning. So uh, this is a, a, a lovely example from a group that uh, made an injury, um, which is uh, with a laser, uh, in um, the ear of a mouse uh, where the wound was. Um, and maybe I'll actually play that video again. So uh, what you'll notice is, if we play that again, is that um, at first the cells kind of meander around, and then all of a sudden, boink, start flowing towards this wound. Um, and uh, so you can see this abrupt transition also uh, in the in the trajectories. Um, and so so this is uh, this 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 transition from from meandering to swarming. In this case, this phenomenon is called neutrophil swarming. Um, and so this is a transition that's that's not fully understood, um, but it is known that um, as you know, in the as I mentioned at the beginning, in the case of the laser, the the um, the main cause for this threshold was the interaction of photons and the atoms. Uh, in this case, it's actually a direct interaction between the neutrophils, um, which will start to secrete something that attracts, which also starts to secrete the same thing, um, and that 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 causes this this nucleation of swarming. So finally, um, do that uh, we can use microscopy to start to observe these types of, of transitions and really sort of the types of behaviors that we might be able to plot on this diagram, uh, even in uh, now in real tissues. Um, but there's, there's another key thing that we're missing. Uh, so if we really want to be able to uh, move to this description, we also need to be able to turn the, the knobs on these axes. We need to be able to systematically uh, tune uh, the strength of the stimulus. So in other words, we need, we need some way of doing something that's equivalent to turning on uh, the lamp. So, uh, so some kind of tunable driver of, of inflammation in this in vivo context. Uh, so uh, I'd like to just leave you with, with one uh, approach to this problem. Um, which is that, uh, so one of the main drivers of uh, inflammatory responses in this, these uh, cytokines here. Uh, and so uh, uh, what we're on is to be able to uh, drive cytokine production locally uh, by uh, telling a particular cell somewhere in tissue um, to turn on uh, that, using that cytokine using a laser. Um, and uh, so, so with this type of approach, we hope to gain full space control over, over both uh, spatial distribution and intensities uh, of these driving signals uh, within the organism. And uh, ultimately, uh, the goal is that maybe one day we will be able to tune inflammatory response that we do lasers. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, be very happy to take and would like to thank uh, really a number of people who uh, had all sorts of uh, fruitful, helpful discussions and, and, have, and whom I've worked with over time. Skin cancer. Cancer. Lenoma. So immune cells gone awry or is something new introduced? Ah, yes. Okay. So, so, so the cancerous cells themselves are not immune cells. They are, they're skin cells. Um, uh, I believe melanocytes, uh, but I'm not a hundred percent. Um, and, uh, so, so actually, uh, but actually immune cells play an important role in potentially controlling, uh, those tumors. Um, and so there, there is a of, uh, trying to encourage, for example, these T cells, uh, to go in and infiltrate a melanoma um, and uh, and uh, actually start killing the cancerous cells. Um, so so the, the 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 tumor itself is is um, is a different type of cell and a different process, but they're not uh, unrelated. Yes. Or, yes. After injury, you're also getting proliferation of neutrophils. No, um, so 
So I believe, it, so in the video that you saw, I don't think that there's any, so there is proliferation of neutrophils, uh, but it's on a longer time scale. Um, I think in, in this, uh, it may have looked like there was some replication, but I think that that is actually coming i think it's it's it, the the numbers are conserved uh over the course so so over the course of you know something like an hour the numbers are conserved photos that you showed us sort of raised the question is there any analogy from what you showed us in phase transitions because it almost looks like a, one would picture a phase transition um, you know, I think uh, uh, the the jury is still out on that, but um, but uh, but maybe um, uh, you know, I think we uh, there are so if you expand uh, from phase tra phase transitions to sort of sl a slightly more general class of dynamical transition, um, I would go out and on a limb and say I think there's almost certainly things like that going on. Um, we don't have uh, we don't have precise quantitative characterizations for them yet, uh, but that's really what we hope to do. And actually, are you talking about using lasers to actually drive the immune system, mm -hmm. moderate it? Yes. Sort of, like <laughs> sort of like Star Trek. Yes. Well, so right. So we're hoping to do this in uh, in our um we we don't i mean i i don't know that uh uh laser driven interventions would be that useful clinically we're using we're interested in using it very much as a discovery as an experimental tool to be able to be able to um uh controllably drive the system and learn what it and learn what it does um however i, I you know i think uh there's there's other types of um more controlled visual and temporal perturbations uh you know for that that would be potentially more applicable uh, in a sort of human health type scenario. There's people who work on uh, uh, local beads of things that can be introduced into, for example, and locally release uh, different factors, signaling factors. So I think it's, it's not impossible that we would have spatiotemporally modulatable treatments uh, in the future. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're very much on the sort of basic science side. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'll just take a first go to the back there. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a very interesting, simple model, and we know that autoimmune disease occurs when the response uh, is against your own body. Yes. What is the mechanism that is thought today to be behind fibromyalgia? Uh, Ah uh, yes, uh, thank you for that. So, so the so the question is, what is the mechanism beyond behind fibromyalgia? Uh, so, I am going to have to say that I do not know. My understanding is that this is not well understood, but uh, I am also I am not I am not a doctor, and it's I think outside of it's outside of the realm of uh, what I would be comfortable speculating about. <laughs> Related to Miles Miles' question. Are you working with NGH or um, Dana Farber or um, because autoimmune your body can overreact uh, in CLL like Dana Farber? I think you can't get rid of certain things, and then in arthritis you may have an immediate response to foods that bother you. Are you bringing the medical? Are you? Connecting the dots, even though you're not ready, who's got 50 years to get ready? Are you beginning to make those linkages? Um, let's see what. So the, the question is whether uh, whether I'm connecting with, I guess, with with biomedical in in more applied settings to be able to. Um, so uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, there's a lot of exciting initiatives to connect. People like me who do very sort of basic research and uh, more uh, and more clinical um, uh, people. Uh, so I, my home institution is uh, the University of Chicago. Um, we do, and we also have a medical school um, uh, as well as um, uh, a group of people who do immunoengineering. Um, and um, so I I am just I am just at the very beginning of of I I, I actually started a lab the lab there uh, just in January. Um, 
I do have I have uh, one current collaborator uh, in on on the medical school side, and uh, you know that's cer certainly something that that we would look towards in the future. Um, uh, and I would say it's there's there's I would say a thing world I think of um, connections, including uh, all the way into uh, things like physics departments uh, from the medical side. Um, no, it hasn't it, it over. He said typically have been much more siloed, um, but I think. Uh, this is changing over time because as the, can i just finish on that question sure. as an addendum lasers we heard the other day um with the web telescope mm. and then they're using infrared for that they're using infrared to help bones heal mm -hmm. um, so the laser may eventually make oper operations obsolete and barbaric but i'm not a doctor nor am I. Uh, <laughs> yes. So your model and the, the um, photographs that you showed, the images of the of the zebrafish that you stimulated a response to a very localized event. In a human being, sepsis, for example, is is the inflammatory response run amok. It's yes. Way out of control. Yeah. Have you also begun to look at that? response in these little creatures where it's gone way beyond the localized yeah and, and then how do you can you pull it back in can you you know get a response to the 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 system where it actually uh responds positively right so so i guess i i should i should repeat the question the question is um have we looked at a system or, or have we looked at or are we interested in looking at systemic sepsis type responses uh, in, in, for example, our fish system, um, and we have a way of, of pulling those back. Um, yeah, so I guess I would, I would say two things here. So we, we are interested in this, and we actually have looked at one extremely simple uh, sepsis model, which involves exposing the entire fish to a bath of something called lipopolysaccharide, which is um, one of these pathogen-associated uh, molecular patterns that's that actually that uh, it also actually call it can will cause sepsis in in a mouse or a human um uh and so so we we don't uh you know it's, it's sort of sort of uh very early days yet i i certainly don't have don't have a way of sort of reversing this but we're quite interested in also just um in things like the balance between how a localized response potentially becomes systemic and as as you mentioned you know are there any ways of sort of sort of pulling that back that being said, I, I would I would caution that um, uh, actually, uh, you know, so so sepsis has there's sort of a long history of failed sepsis treatments, unfortunately, um, uh, including in in models that are sort of much more complex and I would say closer to the clinical setting than than ours certainly. Um, so I I, I think that that you know it's still a, an interesting place for us to ask some some basic questions, but. Uh, I definitely wouldn't count on us curing sepsis anytime soon. <laughs> we uh, were privileged to a visit in Las Vegas by Albert Sabin. And uh, one of the things he discussed was the common cold and control of that. And he said because of the many mutations of the cold virus, they're trying to have a specific antiviral uh, mm -hmm. vaccine was not really possible. So yeah. Controlling the cytokine response, the cytokine storm, would be the proper way to control it. And I'm not sure how we progress on that. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know. So sorry. The question was that uh, uh, there was an interesting suggestion that um, vaccinating against cold is is futile because uh, because the virus is too genetically diverse and changes too fast. Um, and therefore, uh, maybe it would be a better strategy to try to control the cytokine response to cold, if I understood correctly. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it sounds uh, potentially like a like a very like very interesting, but I yeah I don't know anything further about whether there is active work on that. Uh, yes. So in your movie, yeah. Because it it releases. A molecule, a single molecule of other ones. Yes. The other ones that see that signal, do they release the same signal? Yes. Signal? In this case, yes. Uh, Are they usually based on the gradients in that concentration? Like, how do they? You know, yes. 
Uh, yes. Uh, so they just thought. So yes. So the question. It's a great question. The question is. Um, so in the new in the example of neutrophil swarming, um, is it the case that uh, the 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 cells the cells that see uh, the molecular signal of that first cell start producing the same signal, and then um, is it a gradient of that signal that uh, they are responding to? So uh, this is not. 100% worked out yet, but but the answer to all those questions is thought to be yes. Uh, it's a molecule called LTB4 in this case, um, and yes, it is. It is, and it's and um, uh, sort of the, the there's a a high in your neutral that um, uh, that starts producing this uh, upon contact with necrotic tissue, so dead cells, um, and then uh, and then the other neutrophils start reinforce this signal by by producing it also, um, uh, and the, which causes this collection, um, uh, in yeah, there are a number of sort of interesting questions uh, having to do with that sort of collective behavior that that aren't fully answered. Um, but yes, that's ex that's exactly right. Sarah Lamus, it's the latest rage in life extension. A lot of people are taking it in low doses. Are you familiar with Sarah? No, <laughs> I'm not familiar with Sarah Lamus. Thirty years ago, okay. The immune system drug in place. Oh, interesting. Okay. And a lot of people are taking doses of it and claiming that it. Help somehow, like what I heard, the macrophages, like just clean out the system, get rid of all. Interesting. You're not familiar with it, I guess. I'm not, know. sorry. <laughs> not familiar. Yeah, so can you take us back to the slide in which you showed the track of cells moving around in the tissue? Sure. Be happy. And the question is um, is that motion? Uh, uh, strategic at all? Ah, uh, uh, so this is an interesting question. Randomly. Yes. So, um, so, yes. Uh, great. Uh, it, the question is: Is this motion strategic, or do they move around randomly? So, um, basically, they are doing some kind of a random walk. Um, and uh, what we believe is that um, sort of the behavior, uh, the behavioral patterns of sort of the whole group of cells. Uh, is tuned so that uh, eventually they're able to find things, uh, but individual cells are actually just uh, essentially making random turn decisions. Um, so yeah, so the uh, I didn't tell the sort of full story about uh, about the T cell search behavior, but but really so 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 uh, so T cells are, are are fascinating because um, so unlike in, so these are actually adaptive immune system, and so each of them actually has its own unique receptor. Um, and that only recognizes an extremely small fraction of, of antigen, sort of ballpark estimates are sort of one in ten to the five or something, something along those lines. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so the interesting thing about this is that uh, the cells actually have to find their specific antigen uh, displayed, which is displayed on another cell. Um, and uh, for that reason, actually, uh, a chemotaxis is not actually a a usable strategy uh, for these cells. Once they've sort of gotten to the right zone where there might be something, basically just wander. They just have to search randomly, um, because if you know a cell that gave off a signal, uh, uh, you know you would attract all the T cells, and most of those are the wrong T cell, right? So, um, so yeah. So interestingly enough, these guys do a random search. It's a little bit of a technical question. Do you mobilize the zebra finch so that it's stuck in the same position? Yes, uh, great question. Um, absolutely. Uh, so yes, so 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 sorry. The question was, do we immobilize the Z in the same position? Yeah. So um, one, it is it is far far harder to do microscopy on a moving organ. Um, and so uh, what we do is uh, we so we give the fish a drug called uh, which uh, is a, is an anesthetic and uh, paralyzes them. The heart still beats, and so they still have circulation and. Um, uh, and so forth. Um, and then we actually embed them in um, uh, in agarose in a little hydrogel. Um, and 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 actually, uh, nutrients and water can diffuse freely through that and into the fish. Um, and so there, that's so so yeah. So when during the microscopy, they are they are immobilized um, uh, so that we can watch what's going on inside. Your sepsis model. Mm -hmm. Have you considered using microinjection and using localized? I mean. Precious agent in, or using some of these compounds in a very specific spot in Western spot. So, so uh, we sorry the question considered uh, 
we considered micro injection and other types of techniques in a specific spot to watch a response. So um, I actually think that in this, so it's a, it's interesting and, and the answer short answer is yes, we, we have definitely thought about it. Um, uh, I think micro injection actually, I think uh, for the most part would cause a, a systemic response because uh, micro injection, it goes to circulation actually quite fast. Um, uh, but uh, there might be uh, related techniques where you could uh, inject into tissues, for example, um, that might cause an interest of local stimulus. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea. A very, very, very non-technical question. <laughs> How did a very talented physicist get attracted to inflammation or just to the medical world? Um, so, um, hmm. how to answer, how did, how did, how did, I, how did I get interested in this is, I guess, the question. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess, um, so I have actually always been um, interested in essentially um, uh, trying to understand living systems in, in, in the way that physics uh, can describe inanimate, many inanimate systems. Um, uh, so uh, I guess, as, as Casey mentioned briefly, I actually studied uh, microbial evolution during my PhD. Um, and uh, decided that I, I was more interested in, in, in problems that had to do with uh, collective behaviors of cells within organisms. Um, and uh, so the immune system is, is really just a, you know, a fascinating dynamical system in its own right. Um, uh, and, um, and I was uh, attracted to it partly because, uh, you know, just it seems like there are these sort of sort of states and transitions underneath the surface, but that we we haven't been able we we don't yet have the tools to describe, um, and and that I find really exciting. Autoimmune diseases are rampant and varied, and many of them are curable, and many of them are not. Some of them are the slow progressing, and of course, as humans, we're more interested in what happens to us than surfaces. Um, so I would sort of, so sorry, the question is, uh, can we recreate certain types of autoimmune diseases, especially those that uh, are not, there's not currently a cure for in, in an animal model? Um, so I think, uh, it, so the broad, uh, broader biomedical communities were, is working in, and there's really uh, a lot of people working on, on things exactly uh, like this. Um, I would say that um, uh, Many of these types of autoimmune diseases, this particular, the particular system that I really not the most appropriate um, for a variety of reasons, including just the, the life and as well as um, as well as some of the differences in the adaptive immune system um, between fish and mammals that just I think make it a, a less good model for some of these types of, of processes. Um, in addition to um, you know some types of problems where. Uh, really, a lot of the details of of how organs work um, important. Um, so, I, and I think so, but there is really a lot of work uh, uh, modeling uh, disease in a variety of systems. Um, so, conversation going on between you and the biomedical people at the University of Chicago concerning specific diseases or. So, um, not not right now, but uh, in the future, uh, probably. Great. I can take one more question. Great. One more question. Uh, it looks like you're modeling a, a specific number of T cells in these issues. Do you look at changes in the number of T cells in the process of looking at this? Um, so broadly, so sorry, do we look at changes in the number of T cells um, uh, in, in the process of, of looking, studying these responses? Um, so broadly, uh, yes, we're absolutely interested in that. Um, it's it's a, to some extent a question of of time scale for the particular process that you're studying. So overall, uh, um, uh, the cellular replication times um, uh, are so so something like so actually um, 
mutant cells, when stimulated, actually can divide what's sort of quite fast in the sense that is um, even multiple times a day, which is fast for a mammalian cell, um, not fast for a microbial cell, but fast for a mammalian cell. Um, uh, but, uh, but overall the sort of, sort of cell replication processes tend to be on much longer time scales than, for example, uh, an exploration behavior. So it, it's, uh, de depending on the type of problem, um, uh, we are absolutely also interested in that it's on, on, on the question. Great. Thanks. I'm sure Elizabeth would be happy to hang around for a little bit. Otherwise, thanks everyone so much for uh, showing up. It's great to see such a wonderful crowd. Mm -hmm.